Hi, my name is Ross Reed. I'm an Extension Officer with Murray Dairy. And today I'm discussing how farmers in the Murray Dairy region with different farming systems are planning to manage their business if we have a wet winter. Our guest speakers are Ian Litchfield from Mayrung and Marcus Flanagan from Finley, who both run a total mix ration feedlot bait system. And we have Phil Lang from Tatura and Craig Galpin from Deniloquin who are running grazing based systems. I started off by asking each of them to describe their farm systems and to score autumn so far out of 10, one being terrible and 10 being phenomenal. My name's Craig Galpin. Um, I'm about uh, 20 kilometres east of Deniloquin in the Riverina, milking about 150 cows. Um, um, so scale back because of 2016 and the dairy crisis. Um, so totally grazing now. It was a TMR in 2016. Um, so if I was going to rank the score for this current autumn, it would be probably about a seven. And I say that because it's been the perfect start with um, rain and everything, but we didn't have any water leading up to that point. So I would have liked to have irrigated um, um, wedge tail wheat say in in March and then probably would have been in a worse position at the moment but it would have got us started grazing a little bit earlier than what we have so far so yeah so Craig so um so what sort of what cropping planning did you put in the autumn so annuals crop so sorry so everything is uh wedge tail wheat Ross so yep. yeah gone with cereals um and a little bit of oats in of over sown some loosen with some oats so yeah yep. so all cereal no rye grass okay yep and management reason for that uh the you know uh no water so yep. so we i believe that the cereals um hang on much better if we don't have any irrigation so so that's the reason why yes beautiful beautiful all right marcus if you want to jump in next so marcus Flanagan. uh so I milk about 600 cows, uh, 5k east of Finlay. Um, our system's uh, full TMR. Um, we, we've changed, we've been partial TMR and part grazing for probably 12 years. And then we changed to um, uh, full TMR and no grazing. This will be our second winter um, that we've done that. Um, and the reason for the change is um, yeah, being able to try, try and get the cows to reach their potential and, and trying to utilise our, our land as best we can as well. So get it to reach its potential. And um, So we've been busy in the last six months uh, pulling out all our fences. So all our interior fences. So we've got sort of blocks of 80 or 50 or 60 uh, acres still fenced with the channels and drains fenced, but uh, all the interior fences pulled out. Um, and we've cropped everything into wedge tail wheat. So we sowed 80% uh, of the farm in the second week in March after we got two good rains in February and um, and then another 65 mil on the 3rd of March. We went in and started one side and finished the other side of the farm. Um, we just left a bit in the middle that needed to be laser graded and that was sown about three weeks later. Uh, all to wedge tail wheat and a little bit to oats. Um, the reason for that being I'm um, sort of with Galbo as far as um, we can, if you give a cereal crop, we've found, if we give a cereal crop one irrigation in the autumn, we could almost write down, you know, a minimum of six or seven tonne of dry matter off that crop. Um, whereas with pasture, you, you just couldn't do that. You know, you really, to guarantee you're going to get six or seven tonne, I think you'd have to have at least two or three irrigation in the autumn and at least one in the spring or two in the spring. So you're looking at, you know, anywhere from four to five megs. So, so uh, our plan is this year to go through and, and um, be, uh, so because we got all our crop in early, we've done about 270 acres of silage and we bought a little bit of silage off a, a neighbour uh, just in the last week, um, yielded about two and a half tonne a hectare and that's just wheat um, and we cut that about 100 mil high, 125 mil high, just to make sure it would get good regrowth and we didn't damage the growth point uh, on the wedge tail. And um, 
put a heavy urea on that and we're lucky enough to get 12, 13 mil of rain there last, or yesterday. Um, and then we'll go corn, corn, corn next, next summer. So we've got a third of water for the corn next year already. So, so if you had to score the autumn? Uh, for what we're trying to do to be a 10, I've never seen one better. Yeah. With no water to be able to harvest silage in May, for me, I've been here 27 years, that's as good as it's been. Because yeah. we weren't trying to graze. My thinking was I'll get the crop in, get it growing, um, and, and we'll just let it go through and harvest it for silage in September. Um, and the only reason we've done the silage is because we were worried about it falling over and not making it to September. So we didn't need to graze, so we sort of a little bit different to Galpo there. We, we weren't looking to get that feed in the autumn. It just was an opportunity. Yep. Cool. Thanks for that, Marcus. All right, Ian. You wouldn't mind giving the three questions. Uh, Ian Litchfield, uh, farm with my wife, Karen Litchfield. Uh, we're uh, 40 k's from Dillogland, also 40 k's from uh, Finlay. We milk uh, 800 cows. Uh, they're housed on uh, dry feedlots, plus uh, all heifers and everything, so there's nothing grazing here at all. Uh, much the same as Marcus, haven't been grazing for the last two years or more. Um, rating out of uh, 10, uh, I'd go with Marcus there, 10 out of 10 for us. We started sowing the 1st of uh, April with wedgetail wheat and then got a couple of rains and continued on after that with kitty hawk and then finished off with planted barley with, with a bit of veg too. Um, so the wedge sale's gone that good that uh, it's, some of it's actually going to head at present. So we probably need to be looking at uh, cutting some for silage in the next few weeks if we can. So uh, um, what other questions were there? No, that's all right. No, no, that, I, think you, I think you just about done it. So you, you're going to have an issue <laughs> trying to get on and remove some feed. So that's a good problem. <laughs> good problem probably to have. So that's all. And thanks, Ian. Um, Phil, so um, probably to give a bit of context, so um, Craig um, Ian, and Marcus all were part of our um, autumn startup um, um, farming with Lowell, um, managing with less um, back in the autumn, so, um, or progressing with less, I should say. Um, Phil, um, thanks for jumping on online today and doing this for us. So, uh, Phil, if you want to give a bit of a rundown of those three questions. Um, your system's probably a little bit different to the other three guys. Um, so how are we going? Yeah, hi Ross, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, we're a bit different. Um, we're just uh, 5K south of Tatura. So uh, a little bit different to uh, the previous speakers in, uh, in weather. Um, we're doing about 2,000 cows on pasture. Cows are on green, green grass every day of the year here. Uh, we do have concrete feed pads and uh, just uh, this season we're only really feeding uh, grain in the dairy and uh, our own grown silage. Um, this autumn uh, we sort of would normally start irrigating Italian pastures sort of uh, first or second week of March. Last year we started quite late given that water was tight or late for our, for what we're used to. Um, sort of the third week of March and uh, last year autumn was quite warm and mild so we really didn't you know the growth was very good uh, this year I feel we're a bit behind where we'd normally be we uh, we started even later sort of the first the first Italians got sown 20th of March uh, we sort of had enough water to irrigate everything once and the, the better land close to the dairies twice uh, we haven't we've we barely use any water in the autumn because of all the, the rain we've had, uh, but certainly soil temperatures and uh, weather generally has been a bit cooler and we're possibly a bit behind where we'd normally be. Um, so on the one hand, the autumn's been an absolute cracker. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm possibly a bit tighter than I normally would be, um, but uh, there's a bit of carryover now instead, the water I haven't used. and. Uh, Good prospects of having a good season next year. So uh, the strategy for us is to look after the pastures, and not to damage too much. And so that's what we're talking about today, I suppose. It's cow health, mastitis, lameness, and yeah. keeping the pastures in a condition such that they will perform 
next season with potentially good irrigation allocations. Yeah, so cow numbers, sorry, did you mention how many cows? Yeah, about 2,000 cows at the moment. Yep, yep. No, that's good. No, that's all right. All right, so look, that, thank you for that. So that gives a bit of a context of, of farming systems and that was what I was hoping today would be a, a bit about too, is um, we have a number of different farming systems across the Murray region and it's good to um, gather that insight of what different farmers are doing. So, but now probably uh, looking at the prospect going forward from where we're sitting and so everyone gave the autumn a pretty good score and so now it's probably set ourselves up for really maximising a pretty good season, but there's always um, lumps and bumps that come across um, in, uh, in the future. And so all the weather predictors at the moment are really suggesting, you know, an average, above average winter rainfall. Um, and we all remember, and I think, Marcus, when we spoke uh, before we did this to touch base, um, you know, 2016 kind of puts hairs on the back of most farmers' necks of how wet it was and managing and trying to, to deal with that wet winter. So, so thinking about 2016 and potentially that this winter is going to be just as wet or if potentially may not be wetter. Um, so what were some of the issues that we were, you were dealing with back then? And you probably touched on a, on a bit, most of you already around um, lameness and pugging of pastures. But so if you think of 2016 to now, what, what are some of the things that you've really put in place uh, or you've learnt from then and you've changed in your management systems to now to get ready for this year? And I might seem I mentioned you, Marcus, I might kick off with you. You can go first. Yeah, okay. Um, so 2016, yeah, we were, I think, like most, um, really uh, overwhelmed by the, the wet weather. Especially late, we sort of had a strategy early that we were, you know, we were part grazing, part uh, TMR, and we were putting straw in our shade sheds, and and that wasn't working too bad. But then feet started to go, and the straw ran out, and when we thought it was going to start warming up and growing in September, it just got wetter. So, um, so that really, really made it challenging. Um, so what we, oh, I swore to myself, I. I'd, I'd change it because it just, I reckon it set us, the wet set us back more than the, the crash milk price, I think. Um, just that we had just nowhere to hide. Uh, we were milking, I don't know, 730 cows three times a day and and our production almost fell in half, literally in in within three months. And that was a combination of the wet weather, poor milk price, good chopper price, and cows' feet were going, and and so we were just and we and we needed the cash flow, so we culled about 300 cows. Um, completely changed our system um, as far as um, we were, you know, we were at a situation where we were fully feeding the cows all the time, and that was our goal, and and it is now. But during that period, it was like we had to try and cut our expenses. So um, so we changed to that, but then I uh, uh, so we you know we cut cut our grain back put millet in the next summer and, and it was really hard for the country to recover. Uh, I think I, I didn't have any idea how bad it just stuffed the country grazing. Like it's bad, like I think it was wet, wetting the country, leaching a lot of the urea or nitrogen out of it and then putting the cows on effectively ploughing the paddock um, while, uh, while it was wet um, just really had a detrimental effect for the next couple of years, I, I think. Um, which made it really hard to recover. So I swore I was going to change it. So that's when we went in and I'd, I've always wanted to put a free stall system up or, a, or a, a proper housing system that I wasn't so affected by the weather. Um, and so we built a feed pad um, in line with being able to turn it into a, um, into a free stall system. Um, and yeah, that's been fantastic as far as feed utilisation goes. So. Once we got that up and running, it'd be a bit over two years now. We we've been um, yeah full TMR in the, in that feed pad using our shade sheds, you know, for the cows to loaf in. Um, yeah, so that's that's what we got out of 2016. Yeah, cool. I might move on to Craig if you want to go next. What were your what are uh, you? <coughs> so very similar to Marcus. In 2016, we were milking. 450 to 500 cows three times a day and it was just a nightmare. Um, we had an excavator in 
twice to clean off feed pads and it was just a disgrace. Um, really hard on cows and, but it was something that we had to go through. Um, so, so looking now, we've changed that by getting rid of a lot of cows, but that wasn't through choice really. That was um, the economics of what's going on, the milk price in 2016. Um, so, I'm imagining that this year will be a lot easier with only 150 cows and we'll sacrifice paddocks. But we'll just have to wait and see, Ross. Who knows what's going to happen? Yep. So, you know, so it's, it's Rachel and I now. In 2016, we had a lot of staff and um, so I suppose it's only us. That, may, that might be the issue. <laughs> we might end up <laughs> killing each other. I don't know. Anyway. So that'll be the plan is just to um, to sacrifice paddocks and then try and resurrect them later on if we have to, but let's wait and see what happens. It's a, I think it's a really positive thing at the moment that um, that hopefully it is wet, that the dam fill and we have irrigation water because as far as producing feed goes, we can't do it without irrigation water. So hopefully an allocation and we move on from there. Yep, yep, yep. Bill, I might jump to you next. Yep, that's fine. Uh, strategy going forward. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Mm. So uh, I suppose, it, sorry, Phil, I was just going to say, so from 2016 to now, have you changed any of your strategies? What are you, you know, I, yes. putting in a new feed? Yes, yes. But yes, we have. Um, cow numbers have gone up, which, yes, we, we have done work so that uh, we had gravel feed pads. Uh, and we really struggle with them. You know, in line with some of the other comments, we, we couldn't clean them. The, the shit got deeper and deeper. It was tough going. It was hard on cows. So we've, we've concreted them, we've done a bit more work for tracks and drains. We can get water away. Um, we are a little bit better set up with the drier parts of the farm we can get to. Uh, at the same time, cow numbers have gone up. So that increases pressure on everything. Um, yeah, we've certainly learned a few lessons in that uh, you know, even the sacrifice paddocks are valuable. We must look after the land as much as we can. Um, the winter, you know, in 2016, we were really surprised. June and July were tough, but you keep thinking, and middle of August, not far away, and middle of August rolls around, and middle of September rolls around, and I was really middle of October until I was dry. You know, I had paddocks that hadn't been in for six, six months. Um, they didn't really have much feed on them after six months of not grazing because they'd been waterlogged for that time. Uh, you know, feed quality was a big problem. Um, so production really dropped for us in that year. Uh, it was pretty tough going. Um, yeah, we've done a bit of work to, to all the obvious things, but uh, cow numbers have, have moved up. So I guess we're, we'll be a bit more proactive and uh, not just keep imagining that... So at the moment, we're, we're doing fine, um, but once it gets tough, we'll probably move a bit faster on cull cows and those sorts of things. Cull prices are very good um, because we know how bad it can get now. So uh, we'll watch out for that a bit more. Yeah. Um, thanks, Phil. I might jump to Ian. So 2016 to now, strategies that you've changed or mitigations you put in place? So 2016, uh, we were partial grazing and feedlotting. And um, we had the same issues, the cows travelling long distances to get the paddocks and everything and getting lame. So in 16, we had one herd we did leave on the feedlot on the dry feed lot under the shed uh, all winter. We found uh, they were the cows that produced the most milk and had the least lameness. Um, we just rotary hoed under the shed every day, twice a day, give them a soft bed to lay on, and that's where they camped. They camped under the shed uh, on just uh, cow manure. So just rotary all the time seemed to help. Uh, it was still damp, but it wasn't waterlogged or anything like that and uh, soft bedding, which they needed to lie on. Um, we've done a little bit of uh, uh, using an excavator and a um, dump truck in 2016 to clean out the pads. 
and uh, we found that helped too to get the uh, excess cow manure out, which uh, we're doing again now. We've just gone through all the pads here now. We're taking them back to the bare dirt outside the sheds. Still left the cow manure under the sheds for them to lay if it does get pretty ordinary again. And the, with all of it, like everything, uh, which Phil mentioned is uh, drainage. Making sure you've got uh, good drainage to get rid of the water so there's no excess water laying around. And probably our paddocks were destroyed in uh, 16. Um, this year, they, well, I think we'll be in better position this year if it does get wet because we haven't irrigated it at all. It's all dry land. So there's a better chance for the water to get away too. And, and plus we've changed our farming practice with, um, since we haven't grazed for uh, two years. They definitely are, uh, the paddocks are a lot softer, fluffier, and uh, with an air seeder we bought, we've gone through, it's got a deep ripping tool on it, should help with drainage also. Okay. And hopefully, yeah, come, come uh, September, we'll be able to go in and take everything off the silage and vetch probably for hay. Yep, cool. No, that's good. So, so I suppose now it's kind of um, trying to think around some of the other issues that, that came up. So milk quality and mastitis and, and those sort of issues. So where do you sit at the moment? And Ian, I'm, you're on, so I might start with you and go backwards. Um, right. Yeah, so, so how's that going now? And, um, and what are your plans um, if you do have outbreaks or, uh, or issues that come up? So back in 2014, somewhere around there, we had a little bit of a wet winter. We put in a teat scrubber in the dairy. We had that in 16, we've got that there again now. So uh, we found that a great asset as far as cleaning cows. And that, our cell count doesn't change from 100,000 uh, cell count when it's wet or dry or otherwise. So it's a big asset there. Um, sorry, Ed, so, yes. so do you find it a bit more labor involved in that so is there a bit more washing and deep preparation controls that you put in place or it doesn't change from a day to day uh well it, it's an extra a labor unit to not having anyone there at all we first put it in there just to use probably uh when it was wet but we, we thought the best thing to do was just to use it all the time so the cows are used to it it's regular and it helps to let the cows go down too with the teeth scrubbing. And it does a really good job of cleaning the cow's teeth if there is mud on them or cow manure or whatever. So. Yeah, sure. Um, Craig? Exactly the same. Exactly the same as Litchie. So we've got a teeth scrubber as well, Ross, and wouldn't be without it. So we use it every day, no matter what. Um, yeah, so we, use, we reckon that's the best tool of any. When we were, so when we were milking three times a day, we had lots of labour units. And one of my things was that teats had to be clean and dry. And if you left it to the workers, they were clean and dry every day, even if we'd had five inches of rain. So I put something in there that they had to do, no matter what. And, um, and we continue to use it today. So it's a great tool. Uh, Phil, I might jump to you. Uh, yes, yeah, so and my status, uh, 2010 was tough for me, uh, got quite wet in 2010 and coming out of four years of drought, uh, sort of the tracks were not up to it at all. Uh, Phil, if you can hear me, I might hold you off for a sec and, uh, Marcus, if you want to jump in, I'll come back to Phil. Yeah, um, so, yeah, we're, we're different to Litchie and Galpo, we haven't used the scrubbers. Um, maybe something we'll have to uh, investigate. Um, our cell count sort of averages about 140. Um, when it gets wetter, it does go. It does go up. Um, so Just we're... getting the. Oh, Bill's still going there. That's all right. I'll put him on mute for a second, and uh, I'll, um... <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So it does. Um, it does uh, help. Um, uh, yeah, it does get worse when, when it gets wetter, but we've. We sort of bit of a bit of a tour um, in the summer and went to Litchie's place and we went to Marshall's place just to make a, a plan for our uh, winter on the feed pads because I think we've found uh, after doing it for quite a few years that the, the dry lots are good as dry lots 
and um, they do have challenges when it's wet. Um, so we we did we bought a rotary hoe like uh, Litchi, and we we've been uh, using that uh, up until now, and then we've implemented a we made a straw blower out of a, a silage wagon. Um, we we got a heap of store straw stockpiled um, from neighbours that we we bale ourselves just to head of tailings, and we put the the straw in the in the silage wagon, which is fitted with a um, an air seeder blower on the front and underneath the belt. So as the straw's beat, beaten into the front of the silage wagon, it's blown out out the side, and we put that under our shed. So when it's wet. We blow that in twice a day. We blow two two bales in each shed, so two. So you use four bales a day for 300 cows, um, and we've found that's pretty good. We've actually stopped using the the rotary hoe, um, and we just put this thin layer of straw on. Um, yeah, when it's raining like there, so we we'd stop using it for about 10 days, um, or maybe even more, two two weeks, and then this last bit of rain, we we full on using it again. Um, seems to work pretty good, um, but yeah, for me, for me, like I don't, I don't like the wet. I don't like the wet in the, in the, in the sheds. Um, I don't like the cows having to sit in the, the the muck and and walk around in the muck. So that's that's my reason for still. I still want to yeah. change. Yeah. All right, Phil, have we got you back? Yeah, back again, Ross. Oh, sorry, mate. That's all right. So far away. So um, yeah, around your milk quality. Yeah. Okay. So the, probably the bigger bigger issue for us in 2016 was lameness. And um, again, we've done a bit of work for the tracks, and uh, I've got a pile of wood chips ready to uh, as the as the tracks go soft, the stones come up, and who's get soft, I'll put uh, wood chips down, and uh, that keeps the cows moving around. Um, uh, as long as the cows have got somewhere, that, and that will be the biggest challenge if it really gets wet for me, is uh, having the cows somewhere dry enough to loaf. We can feed them, no worries. We can move them around the farm. It's nice to be able to have them sit down somewhere dry and comfortable and clean. And uh, so we do have a few sacrifice paddocks, but uh, there's a lot of cows that have to sit down somewhere. So uh, that's, that's our biggest issue. We haven't had to go on the extent of teat, teat scrubbers or anything like that before but it's uh, one we keep an open mind to. Um, it, it is, mastitis is really only a problem here when it rains and gets wet and cows are dirty, uh, or when it's dry. You know, the other guys would know that the life's pretty good when it's dry. Apart from grass not growing too well, everything else seems pretty easy from an animal health point of view. Yeah, yep, yeah. cool. So, um, so while well, I've still got you, Phil, so um, the other thing I, I think a lot of people um, had trouble with was really um, the people side. So it wasn't only stressful for farm owners and managers, it was quite stressful for staff. So um, Craig, you might not be able to answer this one totally because it's just you and Rachel now keeping that harmony. But um, so Phil, how do you, um, yeah, so what's your strategies for managing staff and remembering how it went through 2016? So what, what are some of the things you're gonna draw? What do you have in place to try and look after your staff? It's, uh, it's the little things that get to people. So <laughs> when the motorbike gets bogged and people have to walk home in the rain, you know, that's what um, gets to people. Um, just so at the moment, uh, even though uh, COVID-19 is ongoing, we are encourage, strongly encouraging some of the people to take whole, a bit of time off anyway, just to have a break, get away from it. Um, you know, there's not much paddock work going on at the moment, so we're all people aren't taking the planned holidays anyway so we can we can handle having a few people away uh, and that's that's pretty important I suppose but um, just making things simple enough and reliable enough and it's just all the little frustrations in the day that that, that build up that uh, makes people's lives hard I suppose yeah cool Ian any your thoughts on how you're going to manage your staff? Uh, what Phil says is pretty right. <clears throat> Little things seem to upset him the most, but if you <clears throat> if you're going around your staff and uh, even working with them a bit and that sort of stuff, it sort of helps out a bit and find out what's wrong and just try and make sure everything's up to date. Maintenance is good on everything. Uh, if you can keep things running as smoothly as possible, 
even if the cows are dirty or whatever, or helping out in some way, or even like keeping the pads clean for them or whatever, it's, uh, it's sort of keeps them more harmonious anyway. And what Phil said too, you gotta to make sure they have time off because if they don't have time off, um, yeah, they go a bit stir crazy. Marcus. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with the, uh, Phil and, and Ian for sure. Um, we, yeah, people have their set days off. It is very, very rare that, like, even we cover in silage, we're really busy. We still try and have them people the days off, so their days off. Um, we, we try to have a few casuals up our sleeves, um, and um, we try not to overwork them. So, so everyone, everyone has their couple of well. Not everyone, all bar two of us have two days a week off, so they only work five days, and, and we try to really stick to that. Uh, and people having support. So, you know, it, when it's wet, uh, I don't know about everyone else, but it's, everything seems to take longer, and you'll have a down cow or more sick ones or a sick calf. So just, you know, guys that might be doing maintenance or doing jobs that aren't essential are, are sort of diverted into helping, you know, so everyone's there, you know, at six in the morning to help get through the, the sick herd and bed sheds or do whatever needs to be done. So it's not putting an immense amount of pressure on, on one or two people. Um, so having the casuals up your sleeve, I think makes a big difference there. Craig, you can Sorry, have- Sorry, Ross, I disappeared for a minute. What's the question? Uh, the question is managing staff and considering it's yourself and Rachel, um, how, how are you planning? So I suppose this one's more for the husband and wife teams. How are you planning to manage your own time to be able to manage if it gets really wet? It's going to be physically demanding on both of you. So what are you thinking or what's your plans to try and combat that? So we've been managing on our own up to, to this point, but we will be using some backpacker, I think, some temporary labour, um, yeah, to give both of us a bit of a break, more from each other than the cows. <laughs> <laughs> and the use of alcohol, Ross. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time, so thanks very much, all of you, for, for participating today. So, so this is my final question to you. So you are the consultant. Um, planning and preparing um, on farm. So one or two points that you think are key take homes that really need all farmers need to be thinking about heading into the winter that may potentially be a real wet one coming. I'll start with you, Craig. I'll go back the other way. Um, I think just remaining positive, Ross. Remember, we do this for a reason. We love it. Some days we think that we don't, but... Um, just remain positive and, um, and harvest as much dry matter on farm, homegrown feed as we can. So yeah, things are looking good. Yep. yep. Bill? Yeah, for us, it's important to uh, uh, just look after everything that, that, that keeps the show turning. You know? We work very hard to not pug the whole farm, uh, work hard to look after the cows we decide to keep and, and that goes to the people as well. Uh, so taking a bit of a long-term view and uh, keeping the goals in mind and winter will end and it's followed by a spring and a summer and another season after that, we have to make sure we stay in a good enough shape to take advantage of whatever those seasons will bring as well. Yep. Ian? Um, yes, I think uh, this is the year, hopefully, that the stars align for us all. Yeah, stay positive. Look forward to the uh, spring and summer coming ahead because, yes, um, we're still running pretty good at present. Like, it's not too wet anywhere at this stage. So we're better than 2016 at this stage. So, yes. And once we get past the end of the shortest day, the longer days and everything, and, and we, who knows? It depends how much rain we do get. But, yeah, there definitely is. There could be a, a very good season on the other, other side to the, towards the end of the year. And Marcus? Um, so a couple of things. For, for me, it, um, just to remember, this is what we want. You know, this is, we want the wet, we want the rain, we want the wet winter, so um, we, we can't have both. Um, but 
it's important for, for me, I've learned to make a plan and then at a pre, predetermined time, so you're not trying to uh, make a plan or, or uh, fix spot fires when you're under, uh, you know, um, a stress from, from a current situation. So, so make a plan. What, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. And, um, and then be ready to implement that plan as best you can. And, and yeah, remember, um, you know, we want the rain. We want it to be moist. We want moisture in the ground so we get runoff and irrigation water and then we can farm, um, with, you know, whether it's grazing or, or cropping and, and housing your cows. Uh, that's, that's what we need, you know. If it's dry, if it was really dry now and we hadn't had an autumn at all and we we're looking at a dry winter, well, geez, I know a lot of people wouldn't be farming this time next year. So, yep. welcome it. Oh, the thing is to embrace it. All right. Well, thanks, Ian. Thanks, uh, Marcus and uh, Craig and Phil for your time. It's um, it's invaluable to have um, some farmers just give their insight to what they're thinking and planning. And so, hopefully, people will be able to listen to this, or maybe just jump onto the recording and sit down and listen to see what other farmers are are all going through the same situations at the moment and trying to plan. And also, um. If people want to jump on the Murray Dairy website or Dairy Australia website, there's fact sheets around some of the supports around plugging your paddocks. If you would like more information on today's topic, you can always visit the Dairy Australia website, which has fact sheets on minimising the damage caused by plugging your paddocks and other resources on managing your milk quality in wet conditions. Mm -hmm.